Hey everyone, in this video, we're gonna be talking about joints versus mates and how we can get things to move around inside of Fusion. Now, if you're coming from SOLIDWORKS and you're used to using mates to put your different components together, then there is a slight shift that you need to make in thinking about how everything goes together. And in this video, we're gonna to try to explain that as best we can. So first, mates versus joints. If we had a simple bolt that needed to go into a hole or a plate in SOLIDWORKS, we would need to make sure that the face of the bolt is coincident with the top face of whatever it's bolting to. We would need to make sure that the axis or a circular edge is concentric with the hole. And then if we needed to, we could lock the rotation down of that bolt itself. Now, when we're doing this in Fusion, we are using joints, which have a slightly different way of thinking. Now, what a joint does is it allows us to define the entire degrees of freedom of that component in one single operation. Rather than having to add multiple mates in order to put different pieces in place, we can do this with a single option. So there are going to be a couple of things that we need to cover in this video, the differences between joints and as-built joints, rigid groups, how we drive joints in motion, and even things like contact sets. So first, let's talk about a joint. Now, a joint will allow us to define the motion between components and the position that motion is relative to. So for example, putting a bolt into a hole, we simply select a circular edge, and we select the circular edge on our part, and then we allow it to align. Now, in this case, they're flipped the wrong direction. We simply use flip, and then we double check the motion that we want. In this case, a rigid motion. However, if we wanted it to rotate, we simply set it to revolute and allow it to revolve around the z-axis, x, y, or even a custom axis. If we want to add different degrees of freedom, we can add a slider, which allows it to move up and down along that defined axis, a cylindrical option, which allows it to move up and down and rotate around that axis, a pin and slot, which allows it to move horizontally, in this case, along the x-axis while rotating, and we also have a planar option, allowing it to rotate about its axis, as well as move in plane, in this case, in X and Y. And our last option is a ball joint. Now, the ball joint allows for degrees of rotation about the defined axis, and some of the other ones allow for translation and rotation. So determining what type of motion you want with those degrees of freedom is an important aspect of applying a joint or an as-built joint infusion. But once again, it is a single option, a single joint that allows us to put these together. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example so we can better understand how as-built and joints are different and how they're the same. Now, when we have components in an assembly, oftentimes we design them in the correct location. When we have things in the correct location, such as these bushings, we wanna make sure we track that location. Fusion keeps track of the coordinate system of each component, so all we need to do is revert its position. I'm gonna expand the subassembly, and I'm gonna hide the crank for right now. And we wanna put all three of these pieces together, the upper and lower bushing and the connecting rod. They all need to move as one. So we can do that with what's called a rigid group. What we're doing is we're telling Fusion that these three pieces move together as a single unit. Making them rigid prevents us from having to add any joints between each of those components. The next thing that we want to identify is the fact that this component was designed in place. Because it's in place, we can use what's called an as-built joint. Now, as-built joints behave the same as a joint does. However, it makes use of the current location of each component rather than selecting a location where they will be aligned. So in this case, we simply select Revolute. We want to revolve our connecting rod about the crank, and then we simply pick the axis of rotation. You can see in the preview that it's leaving some of those components behind, but because they are part of a rigid group, once we start to move it, it will behave properly. So now you can see we're beginning to create this assembly. I'm gonna revert its position, and next I wanna talk about putting components together that aren't currently designed in place. We have a couple of tools to help us put components together if we wanna use as-built joints. Under our assemble menu, you'll notice that we can select joint or as-built joint. We can also pre-create things like joint origins, the location where things will be held together. But we also have some move copy and alignment tools if we want to put them into their correct location. For example, when we use align, we can align components, and we can do things like select individual faces, and we can make those faces in alignment. We can capture its position directly from here. And we can also use tools like align to go from a single point location, so for example, the center here, to the center here. 
This will allow us to pre-position these components so that way they're in an as-built orientation. However, this is not required when we're using joints. If we go to Assemble and we select Joint, we simply need to determine the motion, in this case rigid, and the location that we want everything to be placed together. Now in our case, the end of our pin is going to be at the end of this bore. Now those two are rigid, which means if we move the piston, the pin is gonna go with it. So once again, there are options to use things like align, so that way we get all the components in their correct location, but we can also simply select the appropriate location when we're using a joint tool. So now we have an interesting situation. We have a space between the piston on the inside and we have a connecting rod. If we do a quick measurement, we can take a look and see the width of the inside of this is going to be 20 millimeters. And if we measure the outside distance of the connecting rod, we can see that this is exactly 20 millimeters. Now, in reality, generally we will have a small gap. And what that means is we can't use coincident relationships between faces, and we really have to use a center point location. When we're creating a joint, for example, in this case, we'll be creating a revolute joint because we want it to revolve around a single axis. When we are picking our locations, we can hold down the control key, which will snap or lock its focus and allow us to select the center point of that pin. And we can do the same thing for the inside of this bore. Holding down the control key will lock its focus and allow us to navigate between available snap points. You can see that we get a preview on the screen. We'll say okay. And now the piston is on the end of our connecting rod. Now the motion isn't quite right yet because there's another piece of this puzzle that we need to bring into view. Now that is gonna be our cylinder. The piston is inside the cylinder now, it's in the correct orientation. So this means that we can use an as-built joint. Now the as-built joint in this case will allow us to use a joint that allows for motion vertically. Now this could be a slider joint because we've already locked the rotation with the pin, or we could use a cylindrical joint that allows the piston to rotate freely while moving up and down. Now either of these will work because it's going to respect all other degrees of freedom that we've placed on the assembly. But in our case, let's use a slider. This is gonna be between the piston and the cylinder, and then we need to pick the axis. This will allow the piston to move up and down freely, which means that once we rotate the crank, now the piston is gonna be behaving as we would expect in the real world. Now, once again, we're doing this with joints. These joints allow us to define the degrees of freedom of our mechanical components by determining where that location is that they should be moving relative to each other and determining how many degrees of freedom we want in translation and rotation. There are several other options inside of Fusion. For example, we have access to what's called a contact set. Now, contact sets allow us to make use of physical contacts between solid bodies. If we're gonna go ahead and take a look at this assembly, as we move this top pin here, it's not doing anything because it's free to pass through other solid bodies. However, if we enable all contacts and we begin to move it, that solid body contact between components will begin to push the other components. And we can analyze this by going to a motion study, selecting our joint, and allowing our joint to rotate 360 degrees. Now, what we're gonna do is simply say at this point, we wanna rotate 360 degrees, and then we can play the animation back watching it move through. I'm gonna reduce the speed and allow it to loop through and play the animation watching it move as we go. So this is a great way for us to bring another level of mechanical motion into a design where joints just aren't the right option. Now, if you're trying to do this inside of SolidWorks, you have to do this with the move command and enable those physics or those contact sets that happen during the move only. In Fusion, contact sets can be enabled and disabled at any point in time, and simply dragging things around on the screen will allow you to enable and access those contacts. So this is a great option when you're taking a look at things like complex gear assemblies that maybe don't have the best option for applying joints. Now, as we take a look at our options, we do also have things like tangent relationship and motion links. So if we're using a revolute and a slider joint together, we can determine the relationship or the ratio between movements of those joints. There are many options when you're working inside a fusion to create that mechanical motion. But the main thing here that we need to understand is that we're locking down the degrees of freedom between components rather than doing that individually with things like coincident and concentric constraints. We're able to put joints on assemblies and allow them to move freely based on their degrees of freedom.
Hopefully this makes sense. And if you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below. Thanks for watching.